why does every team need financial literacy? Yeah, well, I mean, at the end of the day, if you're a teenager, you're in school and school has one purpose, to prepare you for working and providing for yourself and your family. The whole point of school is like, one day you're going to be in the real world. One day you're going to need to get a job. Um, and, and what is the point of working to get a job and doing all that? It's because you need money. So if you didn't need a job to get money, then people wouldn't be trying to prepare students for careers and, you know, resumes and interviews and college and all these things that essentially help you make more money when you get a job. So it's funny because we focus so much on the college part. We focus so much on the jobs, the, the careers, but we don't mention the money. But the, the only reason people go to college and go to all these career trainings and conferences and things is because they want money and they want to get a job that pays them a lot of money. So instead of talking about college and careers and all of these other things, we just need to blend plain and simple skip to the point money. We need to talk about the money, whether you go and become a, a janitor or whether you go become a CEO an entrepreneur, um, you create a, a startup that becomes a trillion dollar company. doesn't matter. You're going to be making money. Whether it's a little bit or a lot, everybody needs money to pay their bills, to pay for food, to put their kids through, through school, to buy school supplies, to any, everything and anything that you need in your life is going to cost money. So when we don't talk about it, it's like we're playing ourselves and we're playing our students and we're pretending that we're preparing them, but we're not. So I think every single teenager, regardless if you go to college or you don't, you're going to get a paycheck. Then that means that you need to know about money. Exactly. I, I can remember when I was a teenager... I thought learning about money was, um, I don't want to say boring, but learning about money can be boring. But then yeah. I don't think that we really put the two and two together, right? We want to live this, you know, fast, cool, hot, you know, you know, life. But then what we really forget is not putting the emphasis on slowing down and taking the time and mastering that context of cash because it feels slow. What would you right. say to some um, some folks that are in the room that, know kind of maybe what they want to do or kind of striving to basically say exactly what you were just saying, but aren't taking the steps to talk, to take those steps about learning about money. Um, how would you? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, I think it's not your fault. The first of all, it's not your fault because when I was a teenager, I didn't think anything about money was directed to me because it wasn't. When you see people talking about money, they're usually old white men with a suit and a tie. They usually work at the bank or they usually on the news. And they're talking about the stock market is up 500 points, the stock market decrease. Oh, we're the stock. What, what the heck does that have to do with me and my life? Nothing. So it doesn't feel relatable. If they're not talking to us. They're not talking about us. They're talking at us. And that's not how you help people. So at the end of the day, when a teenager is like, oh, this stuff is boring, it's because it is. So your job is to find out where are they teaching this in a way that's not boring. Where are the influencers on social media? Where are the videos, the blogs, the podcasts? Where are the TV shows that actually do talk about this in a way that is easy for you to understand it? They're not using all these financial terms and, you know, sounding like a news report, but instead just sound like this, like a conversation. Like if I'm sitting down with my girlfriend, I'm like, sis, you need to open a retirement account. I can't believe you're not putting money away for retirement. Like it should just be things that we talk about every day. But because it's not, when you do bring it up, everybody just thinks of what they already know about money, which is money can buy you expensive things. Money can get me Gucci, Prada. Money can get me Supreme. Money can get me whatever brands I want. And at the end of the day, that's, that's what they want you to think. Because the more money you spend on those products, the more rich you make those companies. And you stay exactly where you are or you get more poor because you just keep getting money and then spending it, getting more money, but you spend it more. And you never actually have money that you keep and grow. So the only way to become rich is really to grow money to a point where you have so much. And so that's the sad thing is that because we're not teaching it in school, we're not talking about these facts. We're not teaching young people the reality. So what they learn is what they see, which is the Lamborghinis on Instagram and the fancy lifestyle, the pool, the vacations on TikTok. And it's like, that is one tiny little portion of how some people with a lot of money choose to live. But that is not how most people live. Most people do not live like that. Even people with a lot of money. I've actually met millionaires and billionaires through my work. They don't live like that. So it's just, it's so funny because we get these false ideas and we think that that's just true, that that's the reality. So I think it's so important for us to help young people realize this is important. 
but admit that it is boring. And so how can we find fun resources and go to conversations that actually are going to teach me about investing and budgeting and saving and all that, but not in a way that's going to make me fall asleep. Why did you feel the need to keep up with everyone that what kept driving your debt? Like, yep. what was that pressure yep. for you? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because now I actually understand it because I studied it and I actually know what it was. Um, it was psychology, but um, but at the end of the day, I didn't know that when I was a teenager. So I'll talk about it when I was a teenager, what my perspective was back then. So when you um, when you like go to college or whenever you're in high school, even right, what is it that matters to you the most? It's not your future. <laughs> it's right now, the moment that you're in in that moment. What am I wearing right now? What are people going to think about me? What are people saying about me? How popular am I? How attractive am I? Who do I like? And I have a crush on them. Do they like me back? Um, what's a favorite music that I'm listening to? The hottest music right now? New music that's coming out. I want to know about it so I can, you know, talk about it with other cool kids. Like, you just care about things that are going to make you popular because that's the world that you're in. You're a teenager. What else are you going to care about? You don't have a lot of money coming at you. You don't have a paycheck yet. You don't have a 401k plan. You don't have kids. You don't have a house. You don't have enough money to buy real estate or stocks or things. So those things are not available yet to you because you're in a point in your life where is you're not making money yet that much money yet so really the amount of money that you do make you're just going to spend it on the things that you care about so i really just cared about like the work the brand names that i was wearing the outfits that i had the music i was listening to how my hair looked my makeup like you know like those are the, the superficial things that i could control that i felt like at least I could control this at least I can look a certain way and I can act a certain way and I can hang out with certain people um and that will give me some status that will that will give me popularity that will make me feel like I'm cool and other people will like me so at least that's what how my thinking was as a teenager I just wanted the boys to like me and I wanted all the cool girls to want to hang out with me and in order to do that, I needed to act like a certain way and, and, and you know, have certain things, um, certain brand name things. And so for me, my money was all being spent to basically, if I'm being honest, it was to show off. It was to show off because by showing off, that's how other people look at me and go, oh, look, she got that. She got this. She's that. And now I feel like now they're hyping me up. So now I feel like I'm cool. I'm popular. And that makes me feel good. Even if I'm struggling, even if I'm hungry and I don't have money to buy a sandwich, they don't know that I can hide that, but how I look that I can't hide. So you try to control the things that you cannot hide that the people see when they look at you. And that makes you more popular, more feel more good. You feel like you're cool. And at the end of the day, what that really means is that any money that you do get, you're going to spend it on making yourself look better or, or perceived better by other people who look at you. And um, you just don't want to be made fun of. At the end of the day, people are so like young kids and elementary kids, middle school kids and high school kids like to roast each other all the time. And you just don't want to be that. You don't want to be the butt of anybody's joke. So you're just trying to stay out of that. And I think that's really what led me when I got to college. Um, I quickly started looking around and I'm like, oh, okay, I see who the cool kids are. And like, oh, he's cute. Like, I wanted to get his attention. And this, and I was so focused on that social, like friendships and relationships and the dynamics. I was not really paying attention to being smart about thinking ahead. What about next year? How am I going to make, make sure that next year is the best year for me? This year might not be it, but how can I start doing something now to make next year and the year after my even better? I wasn't thinking like that. So I think that as much as we can try to tell young people to think about the future, and I know it's hard to do because you, you just care about right now, um, but every single generation makes the same mistake. After year after year after year, people only care about right now. And the people that win at money and win at life and have a lot of success are the people that figure it out. They hack it. They hack life because they realize that you got to be playing chess. You got to be thinking ahead, two, three steps ahead. You got to be thinking about three years from now, five years from now. How am I going to make sure that when I get there, I have this much money. I have met these goals. I position myself to get this job that I want or this career path. And those are the people that win at life. And those are the people that end up being our bosses, that end up hiring us. They end up, you know, connecting us to get opportunities. So as much as you can try to be that person yourself, the earlier you're going to hack life and figure out um, that, you know, that's the way to win. Um, you are at Brown University, right? Mm -hmm. You sign up for all these credit cards, right? Because you want access to cash. Um, that's how they get us all in terms of what does it feel like to be on a college campus with no job, but you still need money and mom and dad yep. doesn't have, don't have it. Yep. You realize you're in, you, when, so we're talking 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 
twenty thousand dollars in debt. Yep. Like, when did you realize you were in a financial crisis? Like, when was that um, like? Oh. Oof. Okay. You know, the funny thing though, is that it was so many different credit cards. I have four different credit cards and, um, I, I was splitting up the balance, like the things I was buying, I would buy with one card and then I'll put that card away, use another card and then use another card. So it's not like every time I logged in and online to my account, I would see $20,000. Like I didn't see that. I was seeing like a thousand over here and you know, 800 over there and then 1200 over there. But when you add it all up, like that's when you're really seeing the total. But I was not doing that because I didn't want to face reality. I was just like, oh, this car has this and that, keeping it separate and spreading it out. But that's literally the worst mistake you can make because that means that you don't actually keep track of the total amount of money that you owe at any given point in time. And this is a big mistake that people make with student loans too, because they take one student loan over here, 10,000, another student loan over there, 8,000, 12,000. Next thing you know, when they graduate, it's like, oh, you owe $70,000. And they're like, well, how did that, that happen? Well, because you kept taking all these little loans from over here and over there and they add up. So you, every time you borrow money for anything, you should always have the mindset that you have one account, one giant pot. And every time you borrow money from people, you need to put a little note in that pot that says, I owe that person this much. It doesn't matter if it's different accounts, different loans. Nope, it's all that one account that you need to keep track of because that's the debt, that's your debt. And, it, and that's the, the, the part that nobody, again, teaches us about like how to keep track of money. It should all be in one place. You shouldn't be like, oh, I got this over here. I got that over there. And it's so funny because I think that my parents, because they were immigrants, they kind of did that. And I maybe I saw that growing up and I thought that was normal. So like my dad, he would he would put a little cash over here um, in the closet in a little zipper bag. Then he would put some money in the shoe box under the bed over here. Then he would put some money over there. And sometimes it would be like, he would forget. And then he would find it later and be like, oh, I forgot to put this $20 over here. Oh, nice. And for some reason, he thought that was a good way of handling his cash. and. It's not. So it's funny because I think that some of those mentality, even if you don't like intentionally take that from your parents, they might, it might still, you know, get in your subconscious somehow. And then it's affecting how you deal with your money because that's what you saw your mom and dad doing, but you never talked about it. And so now it's this subconscious thing that you carry on. Um, so the best way I mean for me to like really have kept track was to put it all in one place. And because I wasn't doing that, by the time I graduated college, that's when it hit me because my parents were like, oh, you're back. You have a job now. You're going to help us pay the bills. You're going to help us pay for stuff that we need. And they were kind of like expecting me to be their ticket out of you know poverty. And it's like, uh, well, how am I supposed to pay off my rent, my bills, my credit card? I want to hang out with my friends. I want to be able to buy things. And I got these credit card bills. So when I sat down to add it all up, that's when it like actually hit me that you know other people think I make good money, but I don't because by the time I finished paying all of these things off, I had no money left. Then when you realized that you had all this money, was it the, what was the fear factor of you paying everything back? Like, what did that, like, how, was it defeating, overwhelming? Like, how did you tackle yeah. it? Well, you know, for me, it was definitely, um, like I was crying. I just, I just sat in my room. Um, I had a little desk. I, I had this like, Every, it's funny my friends now like they come visit me I live in Miami now so my friends come visit me they like see this gorgeous apartment they're like oh my god girl you living good I'm like listen it has been a process a journey because I used to live in this boot like little apartment in Bushwick where I grew up and there were like mice running around and roaches and everything and I I remember we used to have a little bucket in the bathroom we would catch the mice because they would always come and it was such a struggle, like living like that for years and years because I just didn't have money. That's all I could afford. It was like $700 for the room and the landlord didn't, you know, he wasn't pressing us. It was, it was just a situation where like, that's all I could really afford. Um, and the funny thing is like at that time, I just went in my room and I kind of sat down to look at it because I, I knew that I needed to start helping my parents with money. But I was like, I don't really even know if I can. So let me like sit and look at my money. I looked at the paychecks that I was getting, which at that time it was like $1,200 every two weeks. Um, I was a teacher. And so I was like, okay, let me see. When I get the $1,200, immediately I got to give $700 away to the rent. So that leaves me $500 left. And then the other $700 check. My, my Metro card was $121, unlimited Metro card. My cell phone bill was like another $100. Food for the week was like $300, $400 or for the um, groceries for the month. Um, you know, all these things. I started writing them all down and adding it all up. And next thing you know, I'm like, I got no money left. Like I, everything that I just finished putting together, I got to pay for eats away every dollar that I make. 
So how the heck am I supposed to have any money for fun or to help my parents or to do anything besides these, these obligations and these responsibilities that I got to pay for? So that was really when I just sat and I just started crying. I was just like, this doesn't even make any sense. Like I was that kid that did everything how I was supposed to do it. Like I got A pluses all the time. I got GPA high all the time. I got a full scholarship to college. I went to an Ivy League school. Like all the things that, you know, is it your, my parents' dream come true. But here I was like, this doesn't make sense. I, I just cried and... um. And then I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I kind of just figured like, I'm going to figure it out later. Right now, there's nothing I could really do. So I just kind of kept doing what I was doing, like making money, paying my bills, make money, pay my bills. But um, then I saw, I was in like Dwayne Reed or Rite Aid or CVS or something. And I saw this book, Women and Money. And what, and that was a couple weeks after I had that breakdown where I was crying and I added up all my money. So because I saw that book, you know, it's funny, I, if I would have seen that book, and I didn't know about my debt and everything, and I wasn't paying attention to my money, I would have ignored that book. The book was called Women and Money. I would have looked at that book and looked at the magazine next to it and picked up the magazine next to it with some drama about J-Lo. I would not have picked up that book because why, you know? But because I had just had that situation where I was crying and I was looking at the numbers and the money didn't add up. I saw that book, Women and Money, and it was like, it was it's like a movie. Like, how is this happening? This can't be real. How does how does the universe know that I was just struggling, crying about money to put this book right here in front of me right now about money and women? So I picked up the book and it was like nine dollars. That book was literally like everything that I wish I had ever known about money. She talked about saving money. She talked about like how to get a debt repayment plan on a spreadsheet, how to actually sit down and be like, if I make this payment, if I do this, I'll be debt free by that day and that time. Like just knowing that you can do it. So that honestly, I could, the best thing that I ever did was like pick up a book and learn about money because there were all these books I had read in, in school, books about history, books about math, textbooks about social studies, all the things. I never had a book about money. So, so we all see these books, Yandeli. We all read these books. We all like make, promises to ourselves on we're going to do this, 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 this. I mean, how many of us tell us we're going to do all these things? But I yep. think when, how did you believe in yourself that you could right. make this change? Like you could finally do this. And then what kept you encouraged to keep going? Yeah. Well, um, everything that I was, so after that, that book, that kind of showed me like that there was actually a step-by-step -step plan that I could follow. So that gave me a little hope like, oh, well, there's, a, there's actually a plan here. If I follow this plan, like I, I can fix my situation. Um, so that, that made me feel like, okay, at least there's hope. But then I just was like curious because I'm like, if this is one book, imagine, you know, there must be other books out there. Then I just kept reading more books. And the book that actually changed my, my mind that made me really feel like, okay, I can do this and I need to do this. It was actually a book called The Millionaire Next Door. Because everybody who I grew up around never had no money. I mean, I didn't grow up around people with money. And I never met a millionaire. I never talked to people that had a lot of money like that. Millions of dollars? Like, who? Who do I know? Nobody, you know, except celebrities. So when I read that book, it was a book where they interviewed thousands of millionaires. But specifically millionaires that become a millionaire that, like, their parents didn't have money. And they're the first ones in their whole family to actually have million dollars or more. So that's like a first generation millionaire. That's what they call it. So I was like, oh, if these people could make a million dollars but their parents never had it and nobody else, that's like me. Like my parents don't have money. Maybe I could do what they're, what they're doing and have a million dollars one day. Like, how could I do that? So I started reading the book and it's like, it's like interviewing them. Like, how much money do you spend on a watch? If you ask 100 people, how, how much money do a millionaire spend on a watch? They're going to say probably like four or $500. They're going to say a thousand dollars. Like, these people were like a watch, like 40 bucks, 30 bucks. Why would you make such a stupid decision to spend hundreds or thousands on a watch that is, it's not going to bring you back any money in return. So then they were like, okay, well, how much, how about how much do you spend on like clothes and shoes and, and a tie, like a suit and tie for like meetings? They're like, nothing. Like I would, the most I would ever spend on clothes, like maybe, maybe two, $300 because I wear the same suit to all my meetings. Like then I, then I started opening my eyes, realizing like, wait, what? millionaires don't act rich then if they like it it was kind of like my brain was so confused like it was like I, I never thought like that made any sense because millionaires that I've seen as celebrities they stunt they they go they show off you know and that's what I grew up thinking that I was supposed to do so it basically changed my whole idea about what rich people do with their money and how they live 
And that's when I realized I have to do this. I have to stop shopping. I have to stop wasting money on Jordans and Nikes and all these name brand things. And I have to stop getting my nails done and buying expensive makeup and jewelry because what is the point? Those things are not giving me no money back. They literally just allow me to walk around looking cute and I don't get money for that. So I was like, all right, this is literally changing my whole mind. Like this is changing the game for me. That's when I realized what I need to do with my money is invest it. But I can't really make money investing because I have all this debt. So that's when I decided, okay, I'm gonna go back to that women and money book. I'm gonna do the step-by-step plan, pay off all the debt. And then any money that I get, I don't owe it to anybody anymore. I can then take that money and invest it and grow it. So then that taught me about the stock market, using the stock market to grow money, um, investing in ETFs and funds where you know you grow, you grow your money over time. So I started investing when I was like 20, 23, 24. And, you know, the first person in my family to have, you know, a quarter of a million dollars, ca- like not cash, but like in my investment accounts, like if I sold it, I would have the cash. Most people in my family are like, I don't think we ever had that much money because we always owe money. We always owe and we always borrow money and we have to pay it back. So that was for me, like probably the biggest game changer was the idea that rich people you have an idea in your head about how rich people live. And guess what is wrong? That's not true. That's, that's a lie. And they want you to believe that lie. So you can want to live like that. And you just keep spending your money and wasting your money. And you never actually learn how to grow the money. So that's what I wish more people uh, talked about. Absolutely. And I think that goes back to, again, psychology and psychology of marketing, yep. how much money, millions and millions and millions of dollars, um, companies like advertising. Nike, yep. Puma, absolutely. Right. We don't realize that we are the prey in that sort of scenario because they know that we're shoppers, right? We are, yes. we are kind of born trained to be consumers. We are right. not born trained to be producers. That's right. So until- That's a great point. So actually I'm writing a book and one of the chapters in my book says that when you wake up in the morning, you go brush your teeth, you get dressed, you get ready. As soon as you walk out the door, you see an ad. You see an ad on the bus, you see an ad on the train, you, you hear a commercial on the radio, you, you scroll on your phone and you see ads on TikTok, ads on Instagram, ads on Facebook, ads on YouTube. And we don't realize that. That literally is messing with your head. Every time you literally breathe in ads all day on your phone, in the radio, on TV, everything, everything is ads. And what are those ads doing? They don't teach you nothing. The ads are trying to get you to buy whatever they're selling. And that's taking the money out of your pocket. So anything that's trying to take money out of your pocket, you need to be looking at that like it's the enemy. That is not your friend. They, they're trying to take your money from you. Why? Like, why? That's not helping you. So that's how I, I started to try to, like, teach younger people, like, be critical of everybody and everything that wants your money. They're trying to take your money. You got to work hard to stop them. Yeah, don't be sh- don't be shy, y'all. Like, I literally, I talk to students all day, every day, and I answer any questions. Don't be shy. Yeah, no, they are all like, we're the, I took the mute off because questions are coming my way. No one wants to be on camera. But one question, okay. is, um, yeah, Janaya is looking at, Janaya wants to know, she gets a paycheck and um, she sets <laughs> around $300. And she says, okay. how is she able to balance with the things, the luxuries that she wants? Because she likes the nice things and they're all shaking their heads when you gave down the list. What is the amount of money that she should put towards saving or investment? Yep. So it's actually, there's a chart, um, which is called the, um, the simple math behind uh, early retirement, which honestly is like everybody's goal is that they don't want to have to work until the day they die. They just want to not work, right? But the math behind it is basically like when you take algebra and you learn about, um, what are those called? Like uh, the algebraic expressions, like function. It's all about the percentage that it's growing. So if it's a linear function, the percentage is the same every year and it grows nice and steady. But if it's an exponential function, if you're using exponents to do the math, then the money is going to grow way faster and you can get rich faster. So at the end of the day, that means that the number, the percentage of how much you put away, the higher that percentage is, the more the money is going to grow and the faster you can have a lot of money. The smaller the percentage is, then the less... um, you're going to save and the less, the more, the shorter the time it's going to take. Right. So the simple way to say is like, if you save 5% of every paycheck that you get in your life, you can stop working when you're 66 years old. Mm. If you save 10% of every paycheck you ever get in your life. So you divide it by 10 and take that piece and save it. You can stop working when you're 51 years old. Mm. But if you, if you go ham and you you bring in extra money, you do what you got to do. Like you really try so hard to save 50%. 
half of every paycheck you ever got, then you only have to worry. You only have to work until um, for 17 years. So instead, oh, sorry. So I said that wrong. So, so you say 5%, you have to work for 66 years, not until you're 66 years old. Right. You have to work for 66 years. And if you say 10%, you work for 51 years and then you can stop working. So if you save 50%, half of every check that you ever get, you put it away, then that means that you will stop working in 17 years. Mm -hmm. And this is the type of stuff that people don't teach us, right? So for me, when I was, when I finally got out of debt, I was like, now I got money. Now I can buy the things that I want and all that stuff. And I stopped myself. I was like, nope, I have to save as much as I can so that I can stop working sooner. Because then if I'm not working anymore, I can do whatever I want. I don't have to go to a job to make money. I can sell a course. I can do coaching. I can write a book. I can volunteer. I, whatever I feel like doing. I don't have to like go to this office every day and work just because I need a paycheck. So and Nelly, where, what, now that I save my money, I, do I put it in a savings account? Like, where does it go? Like, what do I do? Yeah. In there, like calling my name. Yeah, Send that's me. a good, Send that's me. a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I would, I always tell people you need, there's a couple different buckets that you need for your money. Yes. It's all kind of like, you know, total your money, but the, the money has to be in different sections so that it could serve different purposes. Right. So if I have an emergency, actually, matter of fact, the other day, my molar, um, my wisdom tooth on the top right side of my mouth, it was growing out outwards and it was like jamming into my cheek. Like I would eat something and it was like, oh my God, it hurts so bad. So I went to the dentist. And my dental insurance that I have only covers half of the cost of that whole procedure for them to take out the wisdom tube and do all the whatever. So the other half was like almost $2,000. Now for me, thank goodness, that's not a problem. In the past, it would have been a problem because I know I wouldn't have had the money. But now I have a savings account where I keep six months of how much money it's going to take me to live. So if my rent is this much, my groceries is this much, my cell phone bill is this much, my transportation is that much for one month. I take that total and I multiply it by six. Mm -hmm. That amount of money in cash for me, it's like about 10 to $12,000. That is what my first goal is to save that much and leave it in a savings account. Because if I need to pay the dentist, if I fall and get hurt, if I need to fix my car, if I need whatever comes up as an emergency, the cash is there for emergencies. And it's just in the savings account so I can get it out today with no problem. But when you invest money in the stock market, you can't just get that money out right away. It's not like a bank account. You would have to sell the investments, wait till somebody buys those investments. Then you have to transfer the money out of the investment account into a bank account. And that takes a couple of days. So it takes a couple of days to sell, a couple of days to transfer. So if the emergency happened right now and you need the money right now, the only place you can really get the money is a, is a bank account. So investing is for money that you have that you make after you put your emergency savings in the bank. So once I hit my $10,000 savings goal, I was like, all right, now any extra money that I have now should not go into that savings account because that's just dumb. Now I'm just over saving. I can, I'm not, the money's not growing there. So once I have that 10,000 sitting there, now the next step is every dollar after that goes into an investment account. And that's when I started learning about, you know, investing in the stock market. My favorite account is the Roth IRA because anybody out there, um, including, I think the, her name was Jemiah, who has the $300 check. If you have a paycheck coming in, you can open a Roth IRA account, which allows you to invest in the stock market. And the profits that you make, you don't have to pay taxes on those profits. There's a lot of different rules with the account. So of course it sounds great, but you can't really touch the money until you're 59 and a half. And there's a bunch of other rules because it's for retirement technically. But if I could go back in time and be 16 again and get my paycheck all over again, I would my number one priority would be to open a Roth IRA, put in 50 bucks, and then keep adding a little bit at a time. Every chance I get more money, add more, add 20 bucks, add 30, add 50 bucks. If I have my birthday money, add 100 bucks, because that money is going to grow so much more than it, anything that you put in the bank. Hi, hi, Yanelli. I had a quick question. Um, yeah. Thinking back on the Roth IRA, uh, I am in college right now in university and I am starting to save money. Um, that was going to be, yeah, that was going to be my next question. What should I be like preparing for next? Would it be like that Roth IRA and investing in that? Yeah, I would definitely say step one is have maybe for, for college, six months is too much, right? Like, let's be real in college. It's hard to save that much because you have things come up every day that you need to pay for textbooks, going out, hanging out. So I would say for me, if I was in college right now and I could do it again, I would put a thousand dollars in a savings account. 
And I would just leave that money there. It's so tempting to touch it. But like, if you can do this, this is the biggest, hardest challenge for somebody in college, like to save a thousand dollars in cash in a savings account and not touch it. Once you do that, you have to pretend that that money just disappeared, like that you flushed that money down the toilet. You can't, you can't rely on it, pretend it's not there unless a serious emergency comes up. Once that money's there, now you're done with the first step. Second step, you start investing in a Roth IRA. And for me, that was honestly the, the that's the number one reason why I was able to hit $100,000 um, of, of my net worth because that money was growing way more than my savings account. Savings accounts right now, 0.09%, like less than 0.1% versus investing on average 9%, 10%. So it's way more money each year. It's just that it goes up and down and up and down and people freak out when it goes down. But you have to know that that's just part of the process. That's like, you know, if the winter comes and it starts snowing and you start freaking out, oh my God, it's snowing, it's snowing. Duh, that's what happens in the winter, it snows. And then what happens when the summer comes? The sun comes out, everyone goes to the beach. And then the next winter comes again, it snows again. It's just a cycle, summer, winter, summer, winter. Same thing, the stock market goes up, then down, up, then down, up, then down. That doesn't matter, that's a fact, it's gonna go down. But if you focus on how much it grows over the long term, five, 10, 15 years from now, you'll be living real good. So the earlier you start, the earlier the 10, 15 years is gonna be. So people wait till they're 30 to start investing. And that is a big mistake. I am so glad I started early, but it doesn't really matter. Whatever age you are, just start. Like it's never too late. It's just a little later than you would have liked. Um, but yeah, college, definitely that savings account. Second thing, Roth IRA. The most you can put in a Roth IRA is $6,000 a year. But if you make less than that, then you can't put that. You can only put what you make. So if you made $3,000 last year, then you can't put $6,000. You can only put $3,000 in there. Otherwise, the government's going to be like, you only made $3,000. So where did the other money come from? That, that's fishy. So you can only put um, how much you made. Obviously, you're not going to put all of your money. So if you can put you know, 20%, 10% of every paycheck in a Roth IRA after you hit your $1,000 savings goal, you are going to be woo, way ahead of the game when you get a little older. I heard that if I have a Roth IRA, they look at that when I'm applying for financial aid. That is a lie. That is false. Any money that you put for retirement is off, like totally off limits. The financial aid applications cannot even look at it. It's for retirement. They cannot touch it. They can't look at it. They cannot factor it in. But if it's not a retirement account, so if you open a Robinhood account, they will look, they will find out that that money is there and it will hurt your financial aid if it's in your name. If it's in a savings account, they will find out it's in your name. If it's in, um, you know, any a CD any, at the bank or whatever it is, if it's in any type of account, if, if it's a brokerage account and you bought some stocks, um, they're going to know because when you fill out the FAFSA, you have to tell them all of your financial records. Retirement is off limits. So that's why the Roth IRA is amazing because it has a few special rules. One, it does not affect your financial aid package at all. It cannot lower how much you get on FAFSA. And two, um, if you want to use the money to pay off your student loans when you graduate, you can. you can. You can actually tap into it early, but only for specific things, buying a house, paying for college, so because it has some special rules that allow you to break the rules of not touching the money to your 59 and a half, it, that's why it's my favorite account, especially college, especially young people that might want to buy a house. You can take $10,000 from that account and put it towards your first home purchase. I mean, it has so many benefits that we, people just don't know about these things because we never learn it. So um, if you take nothing else from today, definitely walk away going, I need to learn about a Roth IRA. I need to learn what it is, what are the pros and cons, and I need to uh, if I work, if I'm making money and I work at a job right now, I need to consider opening one to put some money in there. And if you're not working, consider getting a job and making some money so you can start investing. <laughs> Is there any, um, are there any teen apps that will teach you about stocks or like just investing? Because sometimes the stocks that he's looking at are really expensive. So is, would you right. suggest anything for, is there a site or just like beginners as far as investing? That's a great um, question. Most apps are going to teach you about stocks. Individual stocks, like you said, a lot of them cost too much money. And also they are very risky because what you're doing is putting all your money into one company. And if that company 
falls or just or goes bankrupt or has a scandal and loses money or loses value, you put all your money with them. So I always tell people, it's like when you lend friends money, like if you have $100, you could lend your $100 to your best friend, or you can lend $10 to this friend, $10 to another friend, $10 to another friend, $10 to another friend, and then lend out 10 different friends to borrow $10 each. And then the next week, when they are gonna pay you back, even if one of them doesn't pay you back, guess what? The nine other friends did, and now you make $90 back instead of losing all your $100, lending it to your best friend, and then your best friend never pays you back. You lost all the 100. So with individual stocks, you're lending all your money to one friend and just praying and hoping that they do pay you back. It doesn't make sense, right? So I do not tell, I do not like individual stock picking. I do not I invest in stocks. I invest in ETFs and funds that have hundreds of stocks in one deal. So like buying one roll of toilet paper, and it costs you like three, $4. But if you buy a giant jumbo pack, 20 different rolls of toilet paper in that pack, you pay $6, you save way more, you know, you pay, you pay per um, toilet paper roll, you pay less. So for me, I think people should be looking at buying 500 stocks, S&P 500, that's 500 of the biggest companies in America, you buy one share of the S&P 500, and you automatically buy, you automatically own 500 stocks. So instead of owning one stock, which is not very smart, you now own 500 stocks, which is way smarter. So instead of looking for apps that teach you about stocks, Look for apps that show you about ETFs, which are called exchange traded funds and index funds. I like ETFs better because they're a little cheaper and they're better for taxes, but um, index funds and ETFs are both great. And that's what you should focus your time on. Um, some apps that allow you to do that, oh man, it's hard to say because most apps want you to buy individual stocks because that's how they make money. But um, Wealthfront is a good one. Betterment is a good one. Those are apps that allow you to start. I think Betterment, you, you could start with a dollar, a penny, because they don't, they don't have a limit um, versus Wealthfront. You do need to have $500 to start investing with them. So those are really great apps that teach you about investing. They have um, like blogs and articles and videos. If you check out their YouTube channels, you can, re you can learn from their stuff. It's all free. But if you do start investing with them, then, of course, um, they charge like a small fee to manage the account for you. So that's the, obviously anywhere you go to invest, they're going to charge a little bit for the service. But I personally really like Wealthfront and Betterment and I absolutely hate Robinhood. And I always tell, like my little brothers, they downloaded the Robinhood app and I immediately told, I sent them the, the vomit emoji and I told them to delete that app because they don't even let you inv invest in ETFs. They only let you invest in stocks and they don't even let you invest or they might have ETFs, but they don't let you put it in a Roth IRA. They don't, they don't even offer you a Roth IRA account as an option. So that's not smart because the, the first place to invest is a Roth IRA because it shelters the money from financial aid and allows you to grow your money um, without having to pay taxes on your profits. So that should be your step one when you're starting to invest. Acorns is also good, but my reason why I don't like Acorns too much is because um, they don't have a fee-based structure that is a percentage fee. They charge a dollar a month or sometimes $3 a month, depending on the plan. And my thing is this. If I put 50 bucks in and I had to pay a dollar every single month, that's $12 at the end of the year that I paid, but I only put in 50 bucks. So 12 out of 50 is 24%. That's, they literally took a quarter of my money away in fees. So because I'm not investing a lot of money, paying a dollar a month is actually a very high fee to pay. Versus when you look at Wealthfront and Betterment, they don't charge you a dollar amount. They charge you a percentage fee, which is 0.2%. So if you actually put in $50, when you do the math on that, you just multiply it by 0 0.2 and you see that they actually only charge you $10 instead of, or no, actually 0.2% is uh, 0 0.02. So if you multiply that by 50, they only charge you $1 of your whole $50 investment. So it's going to save you way more money to find some place that charges you a percentage that is very low, like 0 0.2, 0 0.1. ETFs charge that and robo advisors like Wealthfront and Betterment charge that or M1 Finance, for example, those are good apps. But um, Robinhood, they make it free to trade. But what you're trading is stocks and, and you're not able to put them in a Roth IRA account. So at the end of the day, to me, it matters to do the right account type, which is the Roth IRA is the best first one. And then what you put inside of that account should be ETFs and index funds, because if you're just doing stocks, you're taking a big risk and um, it's just not the first, the best way to first start investing.
yeah, if you don't have any guidance and you don't know what you're doing, it's even more risky. You, you pretty much have to be willing to lose everything that you just put in. So with my little brothers, I always tell them like, all right, you put $50 into Robinhood. What if that $50 is gone tomorrow? Are you cool with that? You don't need that money because that's how investing should be, right? That's why you need that savings account first because tomorrow something happens. You don't need that $50 that you put in. You, you, you get it from your, your emergency savings account if you needed it. This money that you invest is extra. So you shouldn't, people shouldn't be putting money that they need in there. Money that you need should be sitting in the savings account for your emergency savings. Number one, they're all paying, they're, they're pretty much being like rich people right now. And they said, how, okay, how do you at this age, like you compared to your teenage life and like going through everything because they all, Okay, Aaliyah just said, what ends up happening is that she ends up spending her money, but like, how did you realize, is there any way we could do it before college? Like, discipline. <laughs> you know, for me, I think it's about the people that influence you. Like, I used to, my friends that I used to hang out with, every time we were bored, they'd be like, let's go to Soho, let's go shopping, let's go bowling, let's go eat, let's go to Starbucks. Everything they wanted to do when we were bored was things that cost money to do it. And once I started getting on my debt repayment plan, I was not playing games. I was like, nope, no more bowling, no more hanging out, no more movies, no more going to Starbucks. Like I was so strict with myself. So then they would be like, well, then you're being whack. What are you going to do when, when we're bored? I'm like, y'all could come over and we can watch something on the TV. We can watch something on my laptop. We can go to the park. We can go throw a Frisbee. We can go to the beach. The beach is free 99. We can go. We can get creative about how we're going to hang out together. But if I'm hanging out with you and all you want to do is do things that cost money, you're not influencing me to meet my goals, my money goals. You're basically just making me spend money and making me feel bad when I don't want to do that. So you got to start thinking now, who are the other people that are on your same wavelength? Who are the other people that are on that same vibe as you that are trying to really grow money and that are really trying to be smart about what they're doing? They're learning about investing. They're reading books about investing. They listen to podcasts about investing. And when y'all hang out, Y'all talk about these things. Yo, did you learn about that Rat that Ray loophole that they got where you could do a backdoor Rat that Ray? That was crazy. Like, you don't even have to pay taxes. Like, that's how you save money. That's how rich people really make money. That's how you, like, then you start having conversations where you see your, you and your friends leveled up. While your other friends, your old friends are like, oh yeah, girl, Kim Kardashian just came out with a new line of skims. I'm about to buy it. And it's like, okay, my love, but what you're talking about is on this lower level and I'm just not interested in that level anymore I leveled up so you need to bring your friends with you if they want to come with you and level up and if they don't guess what you gotta find new friends and I know that is hard to hear because it means that you're literally just like cutting people off and deading your friends but they're not your friends if they don't respect your goals to make more money and be about your money and help your family with their money and begin to grow generational wealth and get out of poverty cycle. If they're not with that, then why would you want them to be your friend in the first place? Come on, you want to level up your friends. And for me, that's like reading books, recommending those books to my friends, having a book club, like, yo, let's get together on Thursday and read this chapter together because I, I want somebody to talk to about this. Listen to this podcast episode. I text it to my friends all the time. My boyfriend, every day he wakes up, he sends me podcast episodes. I send him articles. I'm like, read this. I want to talk to you about it after lunch. Like that, those are the type of friends that you go far with them versus the friends that just, they kind of like worry about things that are not important. And there's just silly things. So there's a balance because sometimes we joke around about silly things, but it's not all what we do. It's just a small part of what we talk about and what we do. I hope that helps because in college too, you got to pick your friends very wisely because there's a lot of people in college that just want to, you know, spend their money drinking and going to parties and doing things that like, it's very tempting to do only that because that's really fun and easy, but you got to find the people that are like about it. You know, those are the people that is better for you to spend your time with them.